Yo! What's good, y'all? What's good, man? It's your boy Matthew Walker here. You know what I'm saying? How are y'all doing today? Hope y'all doing good. You know what I'm saying? Staying well, staying healthy, all that great stuff, man. Listen, before we get into this video, I just want to go ahead and, you know what I'm saying, address a couple of things. Listen, over the past four days, we've gained more than 100 subscribers. We went from 1,400, and now we're at, last time I checked, we're at 1,525 subscribers, man. Clap it up, man. Clap it up, man. Bro, 125 subscribers in four days, bro. A lot of love on the channel, man. A lot of love. I really, really appreciate every single last one of you. I really, really do. And uh, we're going to keep grinding. We're going to keep stay. We're going to keep being lit, man. Y'all love y'all love the Larry Bird video. Y'all love the old school. You know what I'm saying? Y'all love that type of stuff. We're going to bring that energy here. You know what I'm saying? We're going to bring that energy here. So listen. <clears throat> Today we're reacting to making the case. We're, we're on the third one. We reacted to Larry Bird, the first one. We reacted to Magic Johnson. Now we on Wilt Chamberlain, man. We on Wilt Chamberlain. We get A, you know what I'm saying? We're going to be knocking these bids out. But we got making the case for Wilt Chamberlain. Um, so we're going to see the case for Wilt Chamberlain being a GOAT. Now, I know in, in the channel, there are a lot of Wilt Chamberlain fans on the channel, too. There are Larry Bird. A lot of Larry Bird fans. We got a lot of uh, Wilt Chamberlain fans. whole lot of MJ fans. You feel what I'm saying, Matt, Matt and Johnson fans? So we're going to see what's crack a lack with Will Chamberlain. For all the Will Chamberlain fans, you know what I'm saying? If you mess with this video, hit the like, you know what I'm saying? Hit the like button. It shows the support and lets me know if y'all like these type of videos. No cap. So, yeah, man. That's enough talking for me. Without further ado, haha. <laughs> let's get straight into the video, man. Three, two, one. Let's get it, man. Special. The size of the court and the lack of pads or we got helmets give fans the most intimate experience of a team sport that exists. Oh my and because goodness. of the different styles that basketball allows for, players develop their own distinct identities oh. and signature styles yeah. through their creativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flair. Huh? Well. And athleticism. Hey. Hey! And although no player succeeds alone, the scoring volume and two-way nature of the sport give individual stars a nearly unprecedented amount of control over the flow and outcome of a game. For yeah. this reason, players are constantly compared to yeah. their peers and to the legends of the past yeah. in order to answer the most hotly yeah. contested question in the sport. Who's the greatest to ever do it? For many, the question is redundant. They believe in only one right answer, their answer. Others might have their own personal stance, but acknowledge one or two alternatives. But I believe that there's much more nuance to the question of greatness and more answers to it than you might think. By my count, there are eight players in NBA history that have a substantial claim as the GOAT. It's a subjective thing, though. I can't give you a definitive answer. All I can do is make the argument. So today, I'll be making the case for Wilt Chamberlain as the greatest basketball player of all time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh, huh, huh? Wilt. I think from now on, when we're asking more make, making the case, we might skip the intro because we all know what the intro is. The case, right? First, I tell you that Wilt Chamberlain was and remains the most outstanding anomaly of physical superiority that has ever played basketball. That's facts. Then I tell you about how his era-specific advantages didn't exist that. and that Bill Russell had better teammates, which is why he won so many more championships than Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. That's how the Wilt Chamberlain argument always goes. If True. I follow that script beat for beat, I'll be making a video that's already been made a hundred times. So let's write a different script. Okay. We'll hit some of the same notes and see some of the same landmarks. But maybe we can end up somewhere we haven't been before when it comes to Wilton Norman Chamberlain. Where did Wilton. Wilt come from? I don't mean where did he grow up. I'm not making a biography. I mean, what did basketball know of Wilt before he stepped into his first NBA game in 1959? We know about the hype surrounding LeBron, Jordan being taken third in the draft, Magic and Larry's college rivalry, and I think it's important to know and understand what Wilt was before he became the Big Dipper. Wilt was the first basketball superstar. Coming out of high school, he had over 200 colleges vying for his commitment. Oh my gosh! A level of attention completely unheard of for a high school prospect at the time. He committed to the University of Kansas, largely because of head coach Fog Allen's deep ties with James Naismith, basketball's inventor. Mm. 
Of course, freshmen Shout were James only allowed Smith, to play on varsity in those <laughs> days. So during his JV season, the NCAA introduced sweeping changes basketball. to rules like Ooh. offensive goaltending and inbounding violations to try to mitigate what they perceived as a threat to the competitive balance of the game. They even introduced rules that would prevent Wilt from dunking the ball from the free throw line for his foul shots after they got wind that he was doing so in summer scrimmages. And so began the influence of basketball's Goliath, a name fit for Chamberlain not just because of his size, but because of the danger that he seemed to pose to the game's very foundations. Mm. Despite the new regulations, in Chamberlain's first varsity game, he scored 52 points oh, yeah. and grabbed 31 rebounds, single game records for Kansas hey. that still stand today. His first varsity season concluded in the NCAA championship against the undefeated University of North Carolina. Mm. The matchup was broadcast on an unprecedented number of radio and television stations, due in large <laughs> part to <laughs> Chamberlain's <laughs> mythical status. The Jayhawks fell to the Tar Heels in triple overtime despite Chamberlain's best efforts, for which he was named the tournament's most outstanding player. And so heard, the seeds heard. of Wilt Chamberlain's enduring basketball legacy were planted. An outstanding player who put forth Herculean efforts and gave us superlative performances that were nonetheless negated by losing. After one final year at Kansas, Chamberlain joined the Harlem Globetrotters in order to earn money for himself until he became eligible to enter the NBA. Mm. In 1959, Wilt joined the Philadelphia Warriors. Yes, sir. By the time he retired in 1973 with the Los Angeles Lakers, Wilt had changed basketball more than any player before or since. Here are some of his records. Highest PER Sixth for a season. highest career the NBA's PER. All-time leader in Retired rebounds. As the NBA's the second highest leading scorer in total defensive win shares. Second all-time in win shares. Most points in a game. Most points in a game. Highest points per game average for a season. Highest rebounds per game, game average for a season. Most points in a game. Highest rebounds per game average for a season. 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 Highest rebounds per game average people will come to the conclusion that Wilt Chamberlain was far and away the greatest basketball player of all time. Yeah, I come in. On top of his... I know, man. Get your bills, man. Get your bills. Gotta pay your bills, man. I understand. I understand. Gotta pay your... It's a non-skippable ad, bro. Oh, that's kind of crazy, man. All right. Records, Wilt won four MVPs, three of which came consecutively and one of which came in his rookie year. Oh, two tough. championships with one finals MVP award. He would have won in 1967, but the award didn't exist yet. Mm. He was selected to 13 all-star teams and 10 all-NBA teams. His resume would have been even more impressive, but things like defensive player of the year and all defensive teams didn't exist back then. His career accolades are certainly oh, okay. impressive and they place him deeply into the conversation as the GOAT. But the funny thing about Chamberlain's records is that each of them comes with this kind of baked in asterisk or caveat. Okay, he averaged 50 points for a game for a whole season, but that was back when there were no other players of his size. Or sure, he averaged that many rebounds, but back then the pace was totally different, so they came more easily. We'll get into those caveats about Wilt's era in a second, but isn't it funny that Wilt is the only player whose stats get scrutinized so thoroughly? We as basketball fans are so obsessed with stats and scoring, but when it comes to Wilt, we overlook so much of what he did. That's true. We love it when players score more than anything. That's oh, true. Michael dropped 55 on the Knicks after he came back from baseball. Kobe scored 81 in a single game. But when it comes to maybe the most talented and natural scorer the game's ever seen, we look for ways to discredit him. Mm. He dominates the tops of the record so often that I think we've developed a sort of mental filter where we ignore his name and look at everyone else's. Hey. For so many of the players that have a case as the GOAT, I find myself having to justify the fact that they don't have the best stats of all time. But with Wilt, I find myself having to justify his stats because they're too good. Right. To understand how he was able to achieve such eye-popping stats, let's talk about what a superhuman athlete he was. While he was at Kansas, Wilt was a superb track and field athlete. Yep. He excelled at a number of short distance sprinting events, competed in the shot put and triple jump, and won the Big 8 Conference in high jump every year he attended Kansas. Arnold Schwarzenegger once described working out with Wilt Chamberlain. Yo. Wilt Chamberlain you trained with Wilt Chamberlain? Yeah. Wilt Chamberlain would be in the gym, but we eventually ended up doing a movie together. Yeah, come uh, Here comes the, the Destroyer, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I was a big fan of his because he came to the gym and he would do the tricep extension. 
the, like the big guys, the strongest guys, would do, let's say, 120 pounds, let's say, tricep extension, pulling right. down, right? He would come and he would do 150, 170 pounds world champion. That's how strong. That's how they heavy. Are by far the strongest person oh, who's they, ever they, played they, the NBA. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. he, I That's heavy. He lifted me up like one arm like nothing. Along with Jim Thorpe, Wilt Chamberlain was the preeminent athletic talent of the 20th century crazy, at over bro. seven feet tall. Had Chamberlain lived in another time, they would have built statues and temples to him. And on mm. top of all of it, he was a tremendous passer and led the league in assists in 1968. That season, uh, he hey. finished with 702 assists, just two fewer than Ricky Rubio's ever racked up in a single season. As far as his basketball wow. skill set, Wilt's biggest flaw was his infamous free throw shooting. Definitely a deficiency, but not one that I think mars his overall prowess. Some of his success and records surely came from the era that he played in. Basketball was dramatically different in the 60s and early 70s when Wilt was playing. Mm. Back then, there were more field goal attempts, which resulted in more points mm -hmm. and available rebounds. And back then, the average player wasn't nearly as athletic as the average player today. Right. Sure, there were other big centers like Walt Bellamy and some others, but Wilt was decades ahead athletically and had an advantage in nearly Aspects. every game because of that. Okay. So that's it, right? Wilt was ahead of his time athletically, competed against scrawny white guys in a faster era that made stat oh, inflation I don't know easier. about scrawny. If you were to take a 27-year-old <laughs> Wilt Chamberlain and put him in the league today, he'd be just another good player who kills it on the glass like Andre Nah, Trump. I don't think that. I don't mm, think that. No. For one, the advantages of Wilt's era help make sense of how he was able to set such unbreakable records, mm -hmm. but it doesn't detract or excuse the fact that he was actually able to accomplish them. Second, yeah, a 27-year-old Wilt Chamberlain straight from 1964, if you plucked him up and put him into the league today, would have been a great player. Yeah. Would he be an all-time great? Maybe, maybe not. But you're giving him more credit than you think you are when you say that. Mm -hmm. Imagine you instead took a 13-year-old Wilt Chamberlain and brought him up as a player like every other great prospect. Now he gets to take advantage of 60 years worth of advancement in nutrition, exercise facts. regimentation, Yo. recovery science, Yo transportation and yep. equipment technology especially the advancement in shoes you know that they used to play basketball in chuck taylor's right a lot of people don't think that You'd stuff man Will Chamberlain you know what I'm the opportunity to capitalize on his most valuable attributes that think about Will the Chamberlain equipment the shooting the shooting gun machine when we used the gun machine to and to take our shots yes. you know what i'm saying like all those type of things efficiencies of his era but isn't that what everyone does every player has era specific advantages that they use for their benefit What's Steph Curry supposed to say? You know what, guys? I know that the game today revolves around three-point shooting, and I'm really good at three-point shooting, but it just gives me too much of an advantage, so I just won't take as many. <laughs> of course not. Take advantage of your advantages. It's what great players do. All of this stuff I'm saying might not even matter to you. You might be sitting there with your arms crossed saying, nope, Wilt Chamberlain can't be the best because he played in the past, and I didn't see him, so he can't be the best. And honestly, I get that. As sports fans, we want to see the best. It's why we watch. What fun is True. it to admit that the best player your sport's ever seen started his career the same year Alaska was admitted into the union? It happens in everything. Music, film, sports. That's true. It's the struggle yeah. between nostalgia and recency bias. Yeah. But just because it might be a bummer to admit that you didn't see the best doesn't mean it can't be true. So why can't a player from the past be the best? Why can't they? I'm sure a lot of you, though, might be willing to concede that a player from that era could be the best, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't say it was Chamberlain. Mm. I'm sure some of you are saying it's his rival, Bill Russell. Russell won 11 championships in 13 years compared to Wilkes, too. That's a lot of Russell rings, man. was described as the ultimate competitor and as a leader who time and time again inspired and enabled his teams to succeed. And that brings us to the crux of Wilt Chamberlain's case. History says that Wilt was the ultimate athletic specimen who excelled in every physical sense, but who had a critical lack of killer instinct. According to his reputation, mm. Wilt was missing the leadership abilities and intangible mental qualities that are required to win. Oh wow. Wilt is remembered as someone who chased stats, was a bit of a head case, and could never figure out exactly what it was he wanted from basketball. Because of that reputation, Wilt remains an intensely polarizing player. 
Mm. So if I want to make the case that Wilt was the greatest basketball player of all time, I have to find a way to assuage the idea that he never had what it took to be a winner. Right. To do that, I want to use Bill Russell as his analog. Okay. Because they played in the same era and because Russell represented everything Wilt couldn't be or do. They're remembered as inverses of each other and embody contrasting ideas. Team versus individual. Yeah, yeah. Defense versus offense. Yeah, no okay. cap. Yeah. Me versus we, and ultimately winning and losing. But why are they remembered as representing It's kind of crazy to think about that. So the opposite of each other. Again, because they're from the past. They're practically myths and legends at this point. There's less footage of them than there is of other great players, and because the narrative became easy to write as their careers went along. Mm. David beat Goliath, and nobody roots for Goliath. But was the fight even fair for Goliath? For starters, Bill Russell consistently had better teammates than Will Chamberlain did. Yeah. That's as good as a fact to me, and I will maintain it even when I make the case for Bill Russell. I believe so. Wilt played with great players in his career, but Bill played with Bob Cousy, a league MVP, John Havlicek, who went on to lead the Celtics to two titles in the 70s, Sam Jones, a six-time All-Star and master in the clutch, and other Hall of Famers. Yeah, like he, still had, yeah he still had Casey legends. Jones and Frank Ramsey. And of all the great players that Wilt played with, he usually caught them at the beginning or the end of their careers. I see. Aside from notable exceptions like Jerry West and Hal Greer, Obviously, it's easier to be a better teammate when you have a better team, but I think that the most important factor that Russell benefited from, even more than his teammates, was the leadership afforded to him by his head coach, Red mm. Arbach. Red was one of the most forward-thinking minds to pass through the NBA and is still on the Mount Rushmore of head coaches. Of the Celtics' 17 championships, Auerbach was a pivotal piece in 16 of them, either as Boston's coach, general manager, or president. He drafted Chuck Cooper, the first African-American, into the NBA and hired the first black NBA head coach in Bill Russell. Red was an intense, competitive coach who adapted his methods to suit his players. In his own words, if you have some great potential players, there are two things. One, you help make them great. Mm -hmm. Two, you devise a method of play that is suitable to their talent. And that's the thing that I think Wilt lacked more than anything. A coach who could lead him tell him what uh. to do and how to do it. Wilt was a prideful guy and he cared about what people thought about him, which is one of the most natural and human things to care about. Of course, the thing that most people knew Wilt Chamberlain from was basketball. And as a basketball player, Wilt was constantly ridiculed by the media for not winning championships every single year. As he began to develop this reputation of a loser, he started scoring more points so that he could say, well, look, I scored all these points. I got all these rebounds. I did my job. And so he became known as a selfish scorer. And what did he do? He led the league in assists. What do you think people said about him then? Mm. That he was stat obsessed. And so goes the legacy of Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt needed a coach who could help him channel all of his abilities into a winning style of play. No different from guys like Kobe or Michael. Right. I'd argue that if Wilt had played for a great coach like Red Auerbach for his entire career, he would have experienced every modicum of success that Bill Russell did. I promise I didn't just pull that theory out of my ass. I'm arguing that because it happened twice. The two seasons that Wilt won it all, 1967 and 1972, were marked by the influence of outstanding coaches on Wilt's game. Alex Hannum coached Wilt for three full seasons, in 1964 on the San Francisco Warriors, and in 1967 and 8 on the Philadelphia 76ers. When Hannum wow. was hired by the Warriors in 64, he inherited a team that was beginning to unravel. The franchise had been sold during the season and relocated from Philadelphia to San Francisco, leading to the retirement of veteran scorers Paul Reason <clears throat> and Tom Gola. As a result, Wilt shouldered the scoring burden and averaged 44 points and 24 rebounds a game, believing that doing so was the only way to keep the Warriors competitive. The effort was in vain though, as the team lost over half their games and missed the playoffs. And so, Hannum went to work, changing the team's approach and trying to implement strategies that would lead to winning basketball. By May of that season, this was the headline in Sports Illustrated. Hmm. The article describes Chamberlain as exactly the kind of player you would hope he could be. He was scoring less, depending on and trusting his teammates, was defending Ooh, at a high level consistently, and doing all of the little things that led to the team's success. 
by all accounts, that change was due in no small part oh, yeah. to Hanum's influence. Play, boy, Unlike play. every coach before him, Hanum had stood up to Chamberlain, and in doing so had earned the superstar's respect. When Hanum stressed the importance of team play and defensive intensity, Wilt listened. The result was a 17-game improvement from the year prior and a trip to the NBA Finals, all with a team that had barely changed in personnel. For the first time in his career, Wilt Chamberlain, the player who could do anything as a player, was learning how to play. Mm. The following year, the franchise found itself in financial trouble, and the owner traded Wilt to the Philadelphia 76ers for mm. cheap players and cash. Wilt won 55 games with the club in his first full year there, and by the following season, Hannum had been hired to replace Dolph Shays as head coach. Philadelphia started that season an unprecedented 46-4. and By the end of the season, Dang. Wilt had averaged just 24 points a game the lowest he'd had at that point in his career to go along with nearly 46 eight assists and, four. and 24 rebounds a game. Six players on Philadelphia had point averages in the double digits. Wilt's abilities hadn't changed. His mm. approach had. That Philadelphia yeah. team finished the regular season with 68 wins and 14 losses. The best record the NBA had ever seen. After dispatching Oscar Robertson in the Cincinnati Royals, Wilt found himself facing a familiar foe in the Boston Celtics. But with superb teammates and an outstanding coach, Wilt led the 76ers past Boston in just five games. Wow. Ending the Celtics' eight-year reign as champions. Wow. In the finals, Wilt defeated his old team, the San Francisco Warriors, in six games to claim his first championship and cap off the most outstanding professional campaign the NBA had ever seen. A year later, Wilt led the NBA in assists en route to a league-high 62 wins. After a seven-game loss in the playoffs in the Eastern Finals, Hannum retired and relations between Wilt and the 76ers ownership had soured. Mm. He then demanded a trade to the Los Angeles Lakers. With the Lakers, Wilt was saddled with coaches Butch Van Breda Kolf and Joe Mullaney. Not exactly household names. The Lakers had good seasons under those coaches, but were never able to climb all the way to the top of the mountain. Cool. Bill Sharman, a hard-nosed, no-nonsense coach, took over in 1972. That Dang. season, the Lakers went on to win 33 games in a row, Ow. a record that still stands. 33 in a row. The Lakers team finished with a record of 69 and 13, surpassing the mark set by Wilt 76ers five years earlier. Give it up. In the playoffs, they lost just three games on their way to the championship. Jerry West said of Sharman, "He told us he thought that if we played the way he wanted us to, that we could beat anybody." Mm. He got us to believe that right away, and he did it without raising his voice once all year. That's what's up. As for Wilt, he was simply the guy that got us here. Mm. So there you go. That's my case. Wilt was a victim of pressure and a lack of consistent quality coaching. You might be saying, but Clayton, what about college? Wilt lost that UNC game under Fog Allen, and that proves that he's fundamentally a loser. And that's where you're wrong. Because guess what? Wilt never played for Fog Allen. Allen turned 70 at the end of Wilt's freshman year. Mm. And 70 was the mandatory retirement age for state employees in Kansas at the oh, time. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. They appealed it, they lost, Allen retired, and Wilt didn't get along with his replacement. Mm. In Wilt's entire career, he had exactly two great head coaches on two different teams. Yeah, that's unfortunate, man. Both times, he turned in seasons that broke records for wins and ended in championships. Really so much for not being a winner. I know it's a what if, but if you'd given Wilt a coach like Red Arback for yeah. his entire career, he'd have the most decorated resume in NBA would. history. Would think about that. Remember, he really would have. We're though. not talking about the greatest resume. We're talking about the greatest basketball player of all time. Yeah. And by just about every metric that exists, we're talking about Wilt Chamberlain. Yeah. One last quote from Chuck Klosterman. Russell possessed intangible greatness, which means sport writers can make him into whatever metaphor they desire. Mm. Russell was the central figure for a superior franchise, so history suggests he was the greater, more meaningful force. His wins validate everything. If you side with Chamberlain, it seems like you're siding with the absurdity of numbers. But consider this question. In an alternative universe and with a different attitude, could Chamberlain have been Russell? Probably. Could Russell have ever been Wilt? Never. Mm. No chance. Chamberlain, 
is the only human who could have ever been Chamberlain. That's super true. 100%. 100%. Hey, man. Good fit, bro. Good fit, Clayton. You know what I'm saying? That's what's up. That's what's up. If only Will Chamberlain had had that coat, had coach in college who didn't who didn't have to uh, leave at 70. If he was, let's say the coach happened to be 69 when Chamberlain came in and he had one year for uh, Chamberlain's freshman year, I think Chamberlain would have been able to understand what a good coach actually is. And that's also based on IQ, you know what I'm saying? Because some coaches got high IQ, some coaches got low IQ in basketball. So that, that's real unfortunate um, that that happened. But you think about that too, it's like if he did have great coaches, and let's say if he was the one who got 11 rings, or let's not even, not, not even like 11, let's say he got like six, seven rings, like seven. But people would still argue it. It, it. That's why That's why I feel like even if he had 11 rings with all those stats he got, or the stats probably would have changed. Maybe not because of his his athleticism, his, his just freak of nature. But say he had all those things and had that, that superior resume, people will still would still argue the fact that he's not a GOAT. And then the same if like, you know what I'm saying, all these other players, if Bill Russell had the athleticism, athleticism with the rings, they still argue with it. Like it's a never ending um conversation, never ending debate. You know what I'm saying? But that's what's up for real, man. Shout out Will Chamberlain. Shout out Will Chamberlain, man. Good vid, good vid. Hope y'all enjoyed. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you enjoyed it, make sure you drop a like. You know what I'm saying? Helps the channel a lot. Uh, for real, for real. And uh, yeah, man, if you mess with more videos like these, be sure to subscribe because we're going to have nothing, nothing but bangers, man. Nothing but bangers. Um, but yeah, man. Make sure y'all stay well. Stay healthy. Stay blessed. Look, that's very much, man. Peace. I'm out.